I ended the last podcast about heart, how horses have to have it. Well, this particular writer that I'm going to talk about had it and more. And as I reminisced about all the stories I've been telling the last few weeks, my friend and colleague, Dr. Emily Gilbert, messaged me and said about one of the recent podcasts, she was so intrigued about the story of Pat Smith how she broke barriers, and she wanted to learn more about her. And I told her, well, there's another incredible story. And this particular writer was in the same era, born on the 14th of March in 1921 in Denmark. She lived a a life like many young children of the day, but she had this deep passion and love for horses. She loved show jumping, as many young children do. But the one discipline that just grabbed her was dressage. By the age of 13, she already was competing and she was already recognized as an accomplished rider. She was married in 1941 and living in Europe during World War II, Fortunately, she was not as impacted as many other European countries were, and she was able to survive through it. And in 1944, she found herself pregnant with her second child. Yet, sadly, while pregnant, she contacted polio, a terrible disease. Thankfully, she did go on to give birth to a healthy daughter, but she was paralyzed. And you would think her career as a dressage writer was over, wouldn't you? But it wasn't. With the help of her mother and husband, she started to rehabilitate herself and started to ride again. She learned to lift her arms again. She learned to crawl and finally walk with crutches. And the doctors told her, don't ride. Do not ever get on the back of a horse again. But she said no. I'm going to get on. And she did. During her rehabilitation, she did have some horrible falls off her horse, but she got back on there. And the one thing that was amazing about this is she started to train with her horse, Jubilee, which she was paralyzed from the knee down. So she had to learn to not only balance herself without the use of her feet, but how to cue the horse in dressage. But after three years, only three years after her initial illness, this rider went on and finished second in the Scandinavian Riding Championship in 1947. And while her scores should have qualified her for the Olympic Games, despite her disability, women were still not allowed to compete in 1948. It wasn't until the 1952 Helsinki Olympics was this rider able to mount and ride Jubilee in the Olympic Games. And you want to know what? She won the first Olympic medal for any woman rider in an equestrian sport. She got a silver in dressage. She went on to win another silver medal in the 1956 Olympics, despite not having the use of her feet and lower legs. She was a seven-time Danish national champion. She has gone on to be a national hero in Denmark. But despite all this, she, Liz Hartel, said her greatest accomplishment in her life was opening the first therapeutic writing center in Europe. She has gone on to advocate for equestrian sport for those with disabilities. And she was one of the major forces that has made therapeutic writing an accepted form of rehabilitation. On February 12th in 2009, Liz Hartel at the age of 87 rested her eyes for the last time. Like Pat Smith, she too broke barriers, but not only for women, but also for any rider with a disability. Liz Hartel is a true treasure to humanity and our greatest companions, the horses that helped carry her and us along the way. And Secretariat being led, he is numbering... The horse. And the horse is the best thing in the world, isn't it? 
So I suppose one's always, I've always loved them, really. Ever since I was a little girl. Everybody's in line, and they're off. The secretary to wave very well has good position. The love. Oh, I never thought owning a horse could mean so much to me. Secretary not taking the lead. The madness. What kind of a horse is that? I've never seen a horse like that before. Lightning now. He is moving like a tremendous machine. Their story. Mustang is more involved in the, in the early development of this breed than I thought they were, but they were. Welcome to Mad About Horses. I am Dr. Chris Mortensen. I've been an avid equine enthusiast, educator, and scientist for over 20 years. And in this episode of Mad About Horses, we're going to go more into the breeds, performance breeds, characteristics of horses in the English discipline, and then we'll talk a little bit about racing, more focused on endurance racing and a little bit on driving. Now, this was such a large topic that we've broken it into two podcasts. The first podcast was more focused on the Western disciplines and then polo horses, what makes them so athletic, what breeds compete in those events and what makes them special. There is crossover, obviously, with certain breeds. They do both, Western and, and English disciplines, but also in what you're looking for in horses as far as confirmation, performance traits. There obviously is comparisons, but then there are these big differences, and that's what we're going to kind of talk about today and focus on the English disciplines. Now, I talk about Liz Hartel, and Dr. Gilbert did message me about Pat Smith and said, oh, I wanted to learn so much more about her. And that podcast last week, it, it was already going so long, I, I, I couldn't talk more about her. But Liz Hartel, uh, that's a movie I want to see. Hollywood, are you listening? I want to see her story on the big screen. To survive in Europe during World War II, the stress and anxiety, and for her to 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 survive through it, but then at the tail end of it, contract polio, become almost completely paralyzed, but fight through it. Again, the war is still going on, is 1944-45, still learn how to ride again, and then after the war, be able to compete at the top level, to be able to score enough in a competition to qualify for the Olympics, but the Olympic Committee saying, nope, sorry, women aren't allowed yet. Wow. And then, and then to go four years later and win a silver medal, the first woman ever to win a medal at equestrian sport in the Olympics. I mean, that is a story that needs to be told. More people need to be aware of what these women did in equestrian sport. And Liz Hartel is the epitome of it. Yes, Pat Smith, incredible show jumper. She too, oh my goodness, had overcome so much in her life. And then you have Liz Hartel. I mean, two just iconic women in the sport of horses in the, in the 20th century. And it, it's carried on into the 21st century. Liz's sport was also dressage. I, I if you, obviously you've been listening to this podcast, I can't talk well enough about the sport of dressage. I mean, the FEI calls it the highest expression of horse training. I mean, it all dates back thousands of years with the ancient Greeks and Xenophon right in his manual and equitation. But it just, dressage is just, again, the epitome of, of horse riding. It is just shows that intimate relationship we have with horses and before I record this podcast, I watched the last Olympics in Japan and, and I watched their dressage freestyle again just to kind of get fired up. I still, when I watch those riders and I try to watch those cues and I watch their feet particularly and seeing the subtle cues and I just, how did Liz do it? How did Liz Hartel do it without the use of her feet? I mean, wow. So dressage is, again, dancing with the stars in the horse arena. They're doing all sorts of movements and different figures, circles, turns. They change their gates all 
in this arena being scored by judges that are that are looking at the rhythm, the suppleness, the beauty, aesthetic beauty, the straightness, all of these things with the horses. And again, the riders, when you compare it to say a barrel race, which I talked about in the last podcast, and you can see the rider's cues are very exaggerated. Dressage, you can barely tell they're communicating with the horse. That is what makes it so incredible, just the harmony between them. There are different levels of difficulty. So when you go to the Olympic Games and you watch it, watch those riders and see how they 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 work with those horses. Now, generally, competitions are in a 40 meter by 20 meter arena or 60 meter by 20 meter arena. So there's different size arenas that they do and then do these different uh, movements. So the walk, the trot, the canter, their transitions, lateral movements, like I said, circles, serpentines, they, they change directions and half turns. One of the things I really enjoy is during the freestyle round. And have you ever seen a horse skipping? Because I remember the first time I watched dressage and I saw a horse skipping and I was just amazed at the, the lead changes. So the flying lead changes that they do to, to look like they're skipping. I mean, these, these are some special horses. Uh, incredible sport. It's an incredible sport. If you're looking at specific breeds, there are ones that compete at the highest level, but any horse can do dressage. I have seen a camel... Yes, a camel, not a horse, a camel doing dressage at a horse show uh, just to show, uh, you know, the, it was actually uh, pretty great. It, it's online. You can, you can look, look for that. And at the top level, there's just breeds that, that stand out, and those are our warm bloods. Again, just a quick reminder, horses are, are classified hot-blooded, warm-blooded, cold-blooded. Hot-blooded horses, Arabians, thoroughbreds, barb horses, that's the origination of that. And it is not indicative of their body temperature. It's indicative of their temperament. So hot-headed, hot-blooded, right? Cold-blooded draft horses, our gentle giants, our shire horses, Belgian horses, Percheron horses, they are considered cold bloods. And then the warm bloods was a cross between the hot and the cold bloods. So in between, that is kind of the origination of the breeds when they started creating these breeds hundreds of years ago or the last hundred years. At the top level of dressage, you're going to see the majority warm bloods. They too, like the quarter horses and other horses we talked about in the Western discipline, are athletic in different ways. And when you say the big class of warm bloods, that can include a lot of different specific breeds. So a lot of today, what you hear is their country of origin. So, for example, German warm bloods. You can say, oh, he's a German war blood. Well, it could be an Oldenburg, a Hanoverian, a Tricaner, other breeds that originated from Germany. Probably the most popular and the ones that are winning quite a lot are the Dutch warm bloods. And you see them with the KWPN stud book next to their names. So they're referred to as KWPN horses. These are some of the, the top athletes in, you're going to see it in dressage, you're going to see it in show jumping, you're going to see it in eventing. So very incredible, beautiful, expensive horses. They are amazing and awesome. Then if you go to the United States, you have the Tennessee walking horse. That's a warm blood. One that is a very rare breed out of the UK, and you still see them competing, is the Cleveland Bay. And that is a, a British warm blood horse. And there's only you know a few thousand of them less. Not, not many of them left. So they're one of those endangered breeds. Other types of horses you see competing in dressage. You have your Andalusians. So these are your Iberian horses, Spain. You have your Irish sport horse. American Saddlebred, again, another warm blood. The American Saddlebred is one of those gated horses that they can compete in dressage. But then you got the Belgian warm blood, Swiss warm blood, Swedish warm blood. And then you go to our thoroughbreds. 
they show up everywhere. Thoroughbreds, that, that versatile breed that's not just flat racing, you see them competing in show jumping, you see them competing in dressage, you see them competing in, in Western events, just one of our original breeds that can do most anything, and you've got to love them. Now, if we go to top breeds, and I'm going to break this down a little bit more, but let's just go to the Olympic Games because that's recognized every four years. I mean, every year, FEI, and there's, there's competitions all around the world. We talked about that in the history of sport. But if we go to the Olympics and say, okay, that's probably a good snapshot of where we are in the world. Some of the, the top riders in the world go to the Olympics with their top horses. If we look at the breeds, so if we look at the 18 horses that reached the finals in dressage in the Tokyo Olympics in 2021, and nine of them were the Dutch Warm Bloods, the KWPN horses. So half, that's what I said. That, that's the one that you're going to see over and over again. Then the other three were Hanoverians, two were the Westphalians, and then one of a Trikaner, the Danish Warm Bloods, and the Oldenburg breed. So you see a lot of German Warm Bloods in there. So really the Dutch and German Warm Bloods were the top competitors. Then you had a Lusitano Stallion from Portugal. And then when you look at who meddled, Delera, I watched, I watched the video, beautiful horse. She's a trainer mare from Germany, ridden by Jessica von Bredo Werndl. Then you had Bella Rose, who was a German warblood. So she's the Westphalian mare, ridden by Isabel Wirth out of Germany. And then Bronze medal went to Geo, who is a Dutch warm blood gelding. So KWPN gelding, ridden by Charlotte Dujardin out of Great Britain. Now, what's interesting about Charlotte is she actually rode one of the top dressage horses of all time, Vallegro. And he was a Dutch warm blood gelding too. So a KWPN horse. Those are your champions, recent champions. So you can see how the warm bloods are dominating today in the top levels of dressage. But again, along all the different levels, you'll see all different types of breeds of horses, different types of ponies, children learning on, on different types of horses as they go up the ranks and then competing at the top levels are some of the best bred warm bloods we have today. In the last podcast, I talked about pre-purchase exams, and that's important for any horse, for any competition. When you look at the recommendations when purchasing a dressage horse, there's a book, it's Equine Sports Medicine and Surgery, published in 2014, written by Dr. Brian Anderson and others. And in there, it talks about the examination of dressage horses and even show jumpers prior to purchase. And just to quote them, it says, a good dressage horse must possess natural balance, elegance, and athleticism, as well as power and a trainable mind. And then it goes on to say the majority of dressage horses are warm bloods. And again, that you know, they all goes back to our thoroughbred blood, but they are the, the warm bloods of today. They also go on to talk about the makeup of the horse how the horse has to be athletic throughout their body. The horse has to be supple, meaning it's flexible, able to increase the load on their hind limbs to propel themselves forward. And there is different stresses on the joints as they do like these lateral movements, even the flying lead changes, all put different types of stress on the horse. Whereas say a barrel racer, which is explosive speed, halting stops dressage is is dancing you know think about it in the joints up and down so different things to look at one particularly I, I talked about shoulders quite a bit in the last podcast if we take it to the hind end of the horse and and one of the things in dressage they talk about is the hocks so the back leg of the horse and when looking for the ideal confirmation, one of the things they talk about is if you look, go to the point of the buttock, which is really the, the very hind end of their rear end, where it sticks out the farthest, if you hung a line straight down to the ground 
and then looked at the hawks. The ideal position is those hawks, the back line of the hawks along the cannon bone down to the fetlock should be straight. And then you should have like a nice 45 to 50 degree angle with the pastern. That's kind of ideal confirmation for most horses, regardless of discipline. If on that line, the hoof is forward and that angle of the cannon bone and and from the hawk down to the hoof is forward, they call that a standing under. If it's pushed back behind the line or out, it's called camped out. So ideal is that line runs along it. Now, there is something called post-leggedness and and something you want to avoid with dressage horses, jumping horses, uh, venting horses, and that is when the leg's too straight, so it just stands just forward of that line, the line wouldn't touch it. And that post-legginess just puts a lot of stress on the hock joint and all of the ligaments. And one's a suspensory ligament that can be problematic for jumping horses and dressage horses. So the hock conformation is, is, is really important when you look at a horse for purchase. When I talk about confirmation, and I should have mentioned this in the first podcast the other day, there are horses that have terrible confirmation and they are champions. And then there are horses like Secretariat that have perfect confirmation and they're champions. Just because the horse's confirmation isn't perfect doesn't mean they're not going to be a great horse. Really where confirmation is important is trying to lessen the incidence of injury. If there are some large conformational flaws and we push the horse too much, that could lead to an injury that could end their careers. And so we want to be very careful of that. But still, it's good to know conformation because when you are evaluating a horse with your veterinarian, you can make an educated decision on that horse. Another big characteristic of dressage is you do want definable withers. And then we said in our Western horses, we wanted a short back, like in our, especially in our barrel racing horses, that helps them with quick agile movement. Dressage horses, you want more of a medium sized back. I mean, obviously strong back because of the rider and, and doing these movements. But if it's too short of a back, they have really trouble with their extensions. The withers, we want them really defined, and then we want them to be uphill. Now, what do we mean when we say we want the back to be uphill? Well, if you look at the hind end of the horse or the croup, okay, so the the, the hips, the top of the hips, going to the tail, that's called the croup. In Western horses, you generally see downhill, so the croup's higher than the withers. Quarter horses usually don't have like really defined withers, like unlike say a thoroughbred. But that back, that croup is higher than the withers, so their back kind of goes downhill. In a dressage horse, you want the croup to be even, but maybe just a little bit lower than the withers. So then it's an uphill along the back. So when you go to the croup to the withers, it's uphill. Western horses, croup to the withers, you want downhill. And then the other thing is with dressage horses, a supple back flexion so they can bend and do these these lateral movements, lateral flexibility, and then again, that strong back to support the rider. You see all sorts of opinions on what a proper dressage horse should look like. That's just taking kind of a snapshot. With all that being said, I'm going to end with a venting. A venting is the triathlon for horses where we have dressage, show jumping, a cross-country course, all rolled into one. So you have to have a horse that can do all three and do them well. But let's take the second leg of that eventing and just talk about show jumping because there are shows that are just focus on that. Incredible sport, incredibly popular with young children and adults of all ages and genders. So your typical show jumping course is going to change depending on where you are in the event, but different types of obstacles. So it includes single fences, double and triple combinations, spread or wide fences, varying distances and height, 
So it depends on the, uh, the class and level that you're competing at. And the whole objective is to go through the course without knocking down any of the fences or incur any time penalties. If you can imagine what we're asking horses to do in show jumping, this is an incredible athlete that, oh, like I said, precision, that, that, that is a good descriptor of a horse jumping a fence. They have to be precise. They have to tuck their legs up so they don't knock over a fence. And they have to be able to not only leap over the fence, so that takes incredible power with the rider on your back, mind you, and cushion that fall. So physically, we are asking a lot from this horse. It, it takes a lot for them. So they have to have really enough explosive power and scope to jump and get over these fences. And then they have to be agile because it's, it's you know, when you're looking at combo fences and quick turns and tight turns, when we talked about barrel racing, I mean, that was like full bore, flat out speed. You kind of see that in show jumping a little bit, but it's more of precision and agility. They're adjusting their strides, their speeds, the balance, depending on the type of fences. They've got to have endurance to be able to run these courses and explode over the fences. And then the final thing is courage. Those horses need courage because, again, remember the horse, how horses see the world. Their binocular vision isn't that acute compared to ours. They can't focus in a couple feet in front of their face, up to three feet or four feet in front of their face. So they lose sight of that jump. So they, they've got to prepare themselves with the rider on the back and leap at the right moment. And they don't see the fence as they're right in front of their face. And then landing on the ground, they, they can't see where they're placing their hooves, right? So it takes, if you, if you put yourselves in their hooves and then you see how they see the world and then you attack those fences or obstacles and, and it's incredible. It's incredible what they do. Now, looking at specific breeds, a lot of crossover again with, with dressage. Your warm bloods, German, French, Belgium, Dutch, all of some of your top show jumping horses, your Irish sport horses, your thoroughbreds. And this is one that we haven't talked about is the Sella Francais, which means French saddle. This is a breed of sport horse from France. Very popular in show jumping because it's been very successful. You do see them in dressage and obviously eventing. But this is a very athletic horse that uh, created in 1958, but is now one of the top breeds in the world uh, with show jumping. So if we go back to the Olympics and look at our champions, show jumping champions, Ben Mayer from Great Britain uh, won the gold medal with his Dutch warm blood. And today, you know, if you look at what he's competing, this is a few years later, He's riding a Celle Francais uh, as he competes. He is you know, obviously a stable of horses, but that's one of the, t the top horses that he's riding. Uh, the silver medalist was uh, Peter Fredriksen from Sweden. He rode a Belgian warm blood, and he's currently competing with the Celle Francais. Bronze winner is Mikkel van der Vluten from the Netherlands, another Belgian warm blood. So two Belgian warm bloods and a Dutch warm blood won the medals in the Tokyo Olympics. He's currently riding a Holsteiner, so he's riding a German warm blood. But again, different stable of horses, but those are some of the last competitions they, they've been in that they've been winning. So a mix of breeds. And again, you're going to see your thoroughbreds in there, and, and you're going to see different types of ponies, especially with young children learning you know, jumping cross fences and then the, sh the shorter jumps. You're going to see quarter horses jumping, all sorts of breeds. I can do this, but again, at the top, top levels, you're looking at the similar horses. When you come to confirmation, again, a lot of this, you want a, a little bit steeper shoulder. That's something we talked about. 
obviously you want the Hawks to be uh, correct in their confirmation just because that suspensory apparatus during takes off and landings it just needs to be able to withstand those stresses on uh, the front feet, the pasterns, the knees, and then the hind legs, the hocks, and again, those fetlocks, all of these joints and leg movements are important. So that pre-purchase exam when you go to, to get a horse is very important to make sure they don't have any hints of unsoundness. But when I say that, it's so funny because I, I doing the research and, and listening to some of the top experts, they said, yeah, you could talk confirmation all day. But one of the horses that took show jumping by storm, and some of you may know, know this horse, for pleasure, he had terrible confirmation. He had an awful confirmation score. and. His offspring have the same undesirable confirmation traits, but they're incredible jumpers. They're super jumpers. And so and the Hanoverian breeding authorities have even said that they discovered the better the jumper, the worse the confirmation score. So what does that tell you? Well, Marianne Barkaval, she's a leading Swedish warm blood judge and breeder. And she said, when, when I look at a horse, that's 30% of her evaluation. Once the horse starts moving, that changes a little bit. But she said, there's horses out there with poor confirmation that have way more heart than body. And the only thing I, I in, in talking about in this in the podcast, is we just know with really poor confirmation, it could lead to injury. So that is something to always be aware of. And horses with better confirmation tend to live longer. Uh, they, they have longer careers. But that doesn't mean they're going to go out and win the gold medal if they have perfect confirmation and they're a show jumping horse. Okay, now we take all of that and throw in a cross-country course for eventing. So not only do you have a horse that needs to be a good dressage horse, has to be a good show jumping horse, now they've got to run a course with it at the advanced levels goes up to 4,000 meters, which is two and a half miles going over natural obstacles, water, logs, ditches, drops. So the terrain's different. It's not a flat track. There's all sorts of things in the horse's way, and they've got to do this in a certain amount of time. So you're talking about a horse that has to be incredibly athletic. They have to have good endurance, be very intelligent, very courageous, just probably some of your best athletic horses in the world, right? We look at our triathletes, and we're like, wow, you are some of the top athletes in the world that can swim, bike, and run. Well, these are horses that can do dressage, show jumping, and then a cross-country course. And then you ask yourself, is there any differences in breeds? No, nah, nah, not really. You're going to see your same warm bloods, Sele Francais, Hanoverians, Irish sport horses, Holsteiners, all your usual suspects that you see in dressage and show jumping, trained as eventers, but you do see your thoroughbreds, even some Arabians. Entry level, you'll see some quarter horses doing this, other breeds, your ponies. It, you're going to see all sorts of different types of horses do eventing. But again, at the top levels, we're looking at those specific breeds. Now, if we go back to the Olympics, because this is a sport at the Olympics, who won what breeds? Well, Julia Krajewski out of Germany rode Amande Neville, Celle Francais horse. She won gold as a mare. Tom McEwen rode Toledo de Cursor, Great Britain. Celle Francais Gelding. And then Andrew Hoy, a mate down from Australia. Uh, guess what breed out of Australia? Now we do down in this part of the world. I, I had a Hanoverian the other day leading him around. He's, he was a great show jumping horse. This was a Gelding out of Australia. Won bronze medal in eventing. Anglo. Arabian. How about that? 
That is one of our crossbreeds of thoroughbreds and Arabians. So, like I said, even though these warm bloods and some of these other specialty breeds are at the top of their game, you, you do see other breeds get in there and get part of the action. If we look at the top competitors today in 2023, uh, one of the top riders, Oliver Townen, out of Great Britain, is riding an Irish sport horse. That's one of his top horses that he's riding right now. Uh, Rosalind Canner out of Great Britain, she's riding a British sport horse. And then Boyd Martin from the United States is riding an American Tricaner. So those are your, your top eventers uh, right now. So you can see eventing, you do see more breeds coming in, being able to compete at these top levels because it's it's intense. That is, that is ugh, intense sport. Those are your big three. Those are your big three English disciplines today. I talked about it in the history of sport, how so many people around the world are competing in, in those events every weekend. You're seeing horse trailers up and down the highways, wherever you live. Those are people going to all of these different sports. Switching gears a little bit, going to racing, don't need to spend much time here. As far as thoroughbred racing, quarter horse racing, standard breads that are your trotters and pacers pulling that cart or sulky. You have Arabians racing, mule racing, Appaloosas racing all throughout the world and, and other breeds. So usually around a track or a certain distance, pretty much any horse in the world can race. Ponies can race, right? Endurance racing is a whole different ball game. Now, again, any horse should be able to go distance with rest and water and food. But your endurance horses are some of the most incredible, hardiest horses on the planet. Before I get going on that, there is always a concern with welfare. It's in the news, any equine news you see, websites always talks about concerns with welfare. At, the, at official competitions, especially FEI, veterinarians have to be registered and they are specialized in endurance horses that check on these animals to make sure they are sound and they don't have any injuries, right? Or they're there in case a horse does get injured. So that has been a big concern with endurance, but it, but it's welfare has been addressed quite a bit, especially at these top levels of competition. Race distances go anywhere from 25 to 100 miles or 40 to 160 kilometers. So it depends on the type of race. I've mentioned this one before. The, the most extreme is the Mongolian Derby, and that's 1,000 kilometers or 621 miles. It is the toughest horse race in the world. It's the longest. Again, it dates back to the messenger system from the Mongol Empire 800 years ago. Horses are changed every 40 kilometers or 25 miles. So I did listen to my friend talk about that race and how incredibly hard it was. You can just imagine the endurance it took of her to ride and do that race. But then the horses. But again, those horses are changed every 25 miles. But these are your, your Mongolian horses, your tough, hardy ones. And they just have to have the confirmation to withstand those long distances. So stamina is the big one. Then they, they've got to have strong backs and well-muscled and well-sloped shoulders and strong hindquarters and just an overall well-balance of the horse. So going over these distances, those faults don't become injuries. So they've got to be resilient. Good temperaments, efficient gates, because if you're trotting or walking or or even maybe cantering or galloping in certain stages, you've got to be efficient in how they use their energy to be able to go these distances. Adaptable, like I said, in the rain and in the sunshine. So hydration, these are horses that need to drink well, maintain their hydration. Not too big, not too small, uh, and be a healthy body condition score. Uh, an overall hardy, hardy horse. Any horse can be an endurance riding horse, but if you look at specific breeds, one that we've gone back to from the 
very beginning, we started talking about breeds, your Arabian horses. One of the hardiest horses on, on the planet. Growing up in that harsh desert environment where there wasn't a lot of grasslands, one of the most popular breeds in the world, like we've talked about, incredible endurance racers. Anglo-Arabian, so that's introducing the thoroughbreds. But again, thoroughbreds, origins, oriental type horses, so they can go long distances right next to the Anglo-Arabians. Akulteki, that beautiful metallic coated horse that's just jaw dropping gorgeous. Those ones, great for endurance racing. Your barbs from North Africa, again, a, a hardy horse used to the harsh environments of, of hot weather, desert. Then we go to our Mustangs from the Wild West in the United States. Originated from domestic horses brought over during Spanish colonization of the Americas. They got loose, able to survive in, in the harsh, arid regions of the United States. So they're very hardy. Your Morgans, your Appaloosas, paint horses, quarter horses, maybe. Yeah, sure. You could see that. Tennessee walking horses, sure. Those types of horses could do it too. I mean, you're, you can see any type of breed, but your most successful are going to be those ancient Arabian type, Oriental type horses. Those are the ones that, that tend to do well. To kind of finish out this podcast, the one I, I, I just kept thinking, okay, what about, what, what's another sport we haven't talked about? And that's driving. So these are horses that pull carriages, right? And there are events uh, throughout uh, the world with driving. And I wanted to bring it up because also in Paralympics, driving is a big one. And it allows children and adults with disabilities to compete at the top, top levels. It's incredible. The horses are incredible. It looks fun. Really a, a, a very popular sport around the world. Takes a special kind of horse or team of horses to do this. So here's some new breeds that we haven't really talked about. And one of the top ones is the hackney horse or hackney pony. I have had the pleasure of working with the Hackney Mare. Talk about hot blood, flighty, wow, gorgeous. We had a Hackney Stallion. This was back during my graduate school days in California. Dr. Ann Rodick, she loved the Hackney horse. She liked to drive quite a bit. And we had a couple and just very flighty, but wow, intelligent, incredibly intelligent horse. Uh, beautiful. And so they're ones that you see for their their high-stepping animated trot as they pull these carriages. Frisian horses, one of our, our cold-blooded, the feathering on the legs, gorgeous dark coats, black coats, beautiful manes and tails. They are also seen quite a bit in driving. Shetland ponies. I think we talked about them a little bit. You can see them pulling some carriages. The Welsh ponies, Morgan horses we talked about, American saddlebreds, one of those ambling gated horses, the Dutch harness horse, your draft horses, mini miniature horses pull, pull little carts and carriages. And then one that's really fun is the Gypsy Vanner. I've seen a few of those. Talk about one of the most unique looking equids on the planet luxurious manes and tails. They are just, wow, some of the, the most incredible looking horses you will see. So do yourself a favor and Google a Gypsy Vanner horse if you've not seen one. Really pretty. Now, if we look at the top levels of competition, this is just one of my, my favorite names for a horse, Mad Max 81. Uh, it's one of the horses driven by Boyd XL out of Australia. It's an Oldenburg horse. Uh, he's also using some some Dutch warm bloods. So there you see them pop up. Bram Chardon's another top one from the Netherlands, both using Dutch warm bloods. Some of the top riders, according to the FEI website. That brings me to the final one. I had to bring this up because we started with the story of Liz Hartel, and this is the therapeutic riding breeds. Not talking about specifically competing, but these are breeds that are horses that are used for equine-assisted therapy. 
this is becoming a recognized way of, of therapeutic intervention that helps with the physical, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral challenges that many of us face. And one of the things that you want to look for in a therapeutic riding horse is their calm demeanor. Now, there are physical therapists, riding instructors, and, and trained professionals that do therapeutic riding. So if you're interested in that, you can always look in your local area for a trained specialist. But the horses they use just need to be calm. Bomb-proof is what I always say. You know, patient, kind. When you ride them, it's comfortable. And so one of the top horses is the American Quarter Horse. They're just bred for that gentle nature. Even though they're still kind of considered a hot-blooded horse, in any breed, you're going to find horses with flighty behaviors and whatnot. But overall, your American Quarter Horse is one of those. And that goes with the paint horses as well. Similar backgrounds. Morgan horses, similar backgrounds. Halflingers. It's another one we haven't really talked about. And known for their kind temperament. Gypsy Vanner, you see that here. Your Welsh ponies again. Your Tennessee walking horses, your, you know, even Arabians. I, I've worked with some flighty ones. I've worked with some really bomb proof ones. And then the final one today, Pony of the Americas, very versatile pony breed. They look like some of the ones I've seen look like Appaloosas, tiny Appaloosas. I go back to my good friend at Texas AM, Max. Her little POA, Pony of America, that she had, I think he stood maybe 13 hands. He was tiny, but he, oh, he's a beautiful horse, and he was fun to work with. And I, I would say any horse that is just sweet as can be can make a good therapeutic riding horse because you're putting children and adults on the back that that may have trouble staying on, and so you want a horse that's very calm and just this podcast is in honor of Liz Hartel. I, when I first read this story, my jaw hit the ground. She has done a lot for therapeutic riding. The Paralympics began in 1960, but then again in 1996, the Paralympic equestrian sport began. So you had para dressage in honor of Liz Hartel, and then you have para driving. And the FEI brought a para equestrian sport under its umbrella in 2006. So they have organized competitions throughout the world. And if you can just imagine being paralyzed and fighting through that, and within three years, you're back at the top of your game. Liz Hartel's story, it's just got to leave you in complete awe, doesn't it? Well, that completes our, our two podcast series on performance breeds and probably something worth revisiting in lesser known sports, like in pulling or big shire horses or uh, some of the, the muscle competitions. And then we, we haven't even really even touched upon halter classes and what are they looking there and, and how do they differ from, say, a show jumping horse? So it's, it's definitely a topic we need to expand on more. But trying to keep this under an hour, because again, I could talk all day. I could just talk about Liz Hartel all day. Like, holy smokes, what an incredible story. It, if you're enjoying the podcast, please don't forget to subscribe. And if you're at this point listening and you haven't given a five-star rating, it means so much to us and it means a lot to me. It, it helps get the circulation out, helps us get in front of other people's faces. They go, oh, I want to listen to that. I want to learn about horses helps grow our, our, our sports and our industry and, and, and spread the word on how incredible these animals are. Because I think for the last hundred years, uh, the majority of the world maybe has kind of forgotten about horses and, and, we, and, and they are making a comeback and they are important to all of us. And you can also help big time with sharing on social media, one of your favorite episodes. That's how podcasts grow. It's through word of mouth. I a big thank you from the bottom of my heart if you can do that. And you're part of the story. So you're helping grow and, and, and be part of these animals' lives. Again, don't forget to go to madbarn.com, free education, learn link, articles, tons of them. I'm going to link some in the show notes. 
as we go and more stuff's coming in the future. We've got more stuff in the works. Social media, check us out on TikTok. I'm starting to put TikTok videos out, going around New Zealand. So if you want to see where I live, see some beautiful backgrounds, I'm trying to find ones just around me. And then as I expand out across the country, kind of give you a tour as I talk about horses. Uh, but check us out on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and any comments or any topics you want to hear more about, you can always email me at podcast at madbarn.com. But thank you for listening and stay tuned for next week. More stuff coming your way.